it's dangerous to be introduced as pretty cool, because now I have something to um, live up to. You can hear that I'm getting over a head cold, but we'll be fine. You won't get my, my head cold cough from in there. Uh, my name is Allison, as she said. I work for the Zero Abuse Project in Minnesota. I'm extra excited to be in Maine because I have a four-year-old daughter who has a map of the United States puzzle and is obsessed with Maine because she calls it the whale's tail of America. That's just how she, her four, and so I told her, I said, we're going to go to Maine and you could come with me. And you know, my mom's watching her and she's like, we're going to the whale's tail? It's like, yes, we are. So thank you for allowing us to be here in the whale's tail um, today. I'm from an agency that's called the Jacob Wetterling Resource Center, and some folks might not know who Jacob Wetterling is or that history, so I'm just going to do a brief fill-in on that so that, that makes sense, and then I'm going to talk about the internet. And I just want to start by saying the internet itself is not a bad thing. Like, I'm, I'm definitely, my goal here is not to have people leave here being like, the internet's horrible. It's not, um, but it's how we use it, and so I'm going to give some tips on that. I also just want to briefly, Jamie is standing right over there in the yellow name tag waving, Jamie is, um, lives here in Maine, and she is a volunteer and works with one of the sexual assault programs here in Maine. And so if I say anything that for you makes you think, huh, I really want to talk to someone about that, <coughs> you're going to have teachers to talk to, you're going to have parents to talk to, but she's just one more trusted adult who, if you need to, where are you going to be in the room, Jamie, while I'm chatting? She's just out in the back corner. So if I say something that's like, oh, I really need to talk to someone about that, she's just one person that you can use to talk to as a resource today. I'm not going to get into worst case scenarios. I'm not going to talk um, about worst case scenarios. We're going to talk to you about what we're going to do about the problem. But you never know what's going to hit for certain people. We just want to make sure that you have a lot of resources in addition to teachers, caring adults, parents, other folks. So thank you, Jamie, for being here. So I grew up in um, St. Cloud, Minnesota, also a saint, but not St. Dominic. Um, St. Joseph, Minnesota is the town right next to us, sort of in the middle of nowhere, central Minnesota cornfields, things like that. <coughs> and Jacob um, was in sixth grade with me. And he and his brother and his best friend went on their bikes to go and rent a video and then come home and watch it. This, again, was the 1980s, 89, um, where you couldn't get stuff on Netflix or anything else. You had to go and bike and all decide on the same movie and bring it home. Um, so he and his brother and his best friend did that. When they're coming home from getting that video, a man stopped the three boys um, and took Jacob and let the other two boys go. Something like this never happened. These cases, like what happened to Jacob, are so, so rare. We have like 100 cases like this that happen in the United States every year. The other good news is when Jacob was taken back in 1989, they were at a 60% recovery rate for finding missing kids. A few years ago, the National Center said they're at a 97%, 97.5% recovery rate in finding missing kids. So technology has really helped in solving cases of missing people, but we did not have access to that in 1989. In fact, our first big fundraiser when Jacob was taken was for an invention, a new invention called the fax machine. So he could fax his posters places. Like that's where we were at technology wise. So Jacob was the goalie for the hockey team um, for our school. Um, was the Minnesota Wild does, does a tribute for him. Um, wanted to grow up to be a football player, played football, wide receiver, um, and loved soccer. Very athletic kid. Um, also was involved in theater. That's where he and I met. We did theater camps together. He was one of four kids. He had an older sister himself, his younger brother, younger sister. Great family. His mom was in charge of our PTA, so like really involved. His dad was in charge of the NAACP, really involved in racial, racial justice work in Minnesota. So he and his brother and his friend are biking. They're stopped by a man who takes Jacob, and for 27 years, we didn't know what happened. For 27 years, that was the last anyone saw Jacob. After 27 years, they've developed a lead, because um, sometimes time, time can be our friend. They were able to arrest the person. That person did lead us to, sadly, where he had buried Jacob. We were finally able to have a funeral. We had some answers. But his family, when this happened to him, they said, we want to make sure that crimes don't happen to kids. Which is a basic goal. Like, we don't want crimes to happen to children. Kids should be able to play past their driveway. Kids should be able to have, like, go in and, and play sports and do your thing. And so his family started this nonprofit, which I work for today, um, the Jacob Wetterling Resource Center. It's one of the programs at Zero Abuse Project. And the goal is to prevent child abuse. And more and more of my work um, happens online. We can't always choose what happens to us. Sorry. We can't always choose what happens to us. We can choose what we do about it. 
And I couldn't choose that the boy who sat next to me in math was suddenly gone in this really random, very, very, very rare case. But I did decide different people handled their trauma differently. I was this kid in sixth grade who was in the public library and being like, um, can you show me your books about sex offenders? My brain was like, who are you? Like, do you have a parent permission slip? Like, what's going on? And I was like, well, the more that I learn about this kind of stuff, the more I can prevent it from happening to anybody else. And so I started reading a lot about cases of kidnapping, very, very, very rare. But more of the cases that I'm reading about were things that happened with kids and their families, online, stuff like that. Um, so I graduated from a place called St. Olaf, again, another saint, different saint. Um, and St. Olaf is a real place. Some people just think of the Golden Girls. That's probably past your generation, but some of the teachers are like, oh, yes. Um, so St. Olaf has a program where you just can design your own major. So I majored in missing children from my undergrad, later got my master's at St. Cloud State, another saint. Um, and yeah, I've been doing this work for a long time. So that's just sort of like who I am, why I care about this, what this is about. But again, technology is not a bad thing. We would not hand a fourth grader a blowtorch. Say, see how it goes, explore, see what happens, right? They're going to hurt themselves. They're probably going to hurt other people because you don't give a fourth grader a blowtorch. In the same way, when we use technology tools, we want to make sure that we, oh, thank you. See, magic is happening all around me. They're like, we won't have her bend down every time she says, thank you. Um, so we have amazing tools for technology. They help us in finding missing people. They help us in getting the word out about problems that are happening. But how are they being used? The question is, are they being used to help or are they being used to hurt? And it's usually the person behind the phone and behind the laptop making those choices. Catherine Ann said in the intro that I'm, she's hoping I'm going to talk about some of the apps that are concerning. Yes, but almost every app has someone on it who's doing it for the wrong reasons. I've had cases called into our hotline of people victimized on Pinterest. And I was like, Pinterest? Isn't that just like recipes and it's like, what? Why is it happening there? I've had calls of words with friends where people are just playing like words with friends and someone's in the messaging trying to get them to do something that they shouldn't. So it's, it's not necessarily, there are some apps that are more problematic, but it's more about the person behind the app and what choices they're making. So we're going to talk about what warning signs to look for and what to do if we're seeing a warning sign between us or friend and how we can not be a part of the problem. So my first question for you, and I will Ask your thoughts. You're going to kind of put on your criminal profiler hats. And I'll repeat what anybody says so that you can hear it. But the age that's usually most targeted in online crimes are 12 to 17-year-olds. There's a reason I spend a lot of my time with 12 to 17-year-olds. What is it that you think puts 12 to 17-year-olds at risk? Why do you think 12 to 17-year-olds are targeted online? What's one idea? Their generation uses phones, so they have access. They have it in front of them, and they use it. So that's one reason. Yeah, what else about 1217? Go ahead. They're more engaged in the media. In some cases, yeah. I know there are a lot of adults who are engaged in the media as well. But yes, they're, on, they're online. What else about 1217 that puts them at risk? Go ahead. Yeah, so sometimes it's something where you're not as aware of what technology can do and can't do in the sense of what you can delete, what you can't. And I'm fully aware there are some of you that when it's daylight savings, you're the one doing the clocks at your house, right? That when your parents are like, how do I make this work on my phone? That you have that. But internet savvy and necessarily making internet decisions can be two different things, right? So internet savvy, definitely in the sense of knowing how things work. What else? What else about 12 to 17? Put people at respect there. Go ahead. Yeah, some people just might get in over their heads. It's like I, I do youth ministry, and one of the kids in my junior high youth group, she was in sixth grade, and she said, yeah, my dad told me not to carve the pumpkin until he was home. She said he didn't want me messing with the pumpkin and carving until he was home. She's like, but I was bored and the pumpkin was there and I was like, I'm going to carve it. She's like, I carved it. I sliced a bit of my hand. She's like, so I had to cover up all the blood before he came home so he wouldn't know that. I, and it's like, oh, you know, so we sometimes see something that looks interesting. We're like, I can do this. We get in over our head. And then instead of being like, hey, I'm in over our head, we're covering it up because we don't want to look stupid, right? We don't look like, oh, I shouldn't have maybe done that. So it's that sense of in over their head and then maybe not asking for help. 
We get it overhead. One or two more ideas from people who haven't had an idea yet of what it is from 1217. Go ahead. Say that one more time. Sorry. Do you have you guys talked about brain development here? You just know that? That's amazing. Yeah, well done. Um, brains aren't done yet. The part of your brain doing the most work between 12 to 17 is the part of the brain learning how to argue. Did you know that? The neurons developing in your brain from 12 to 17 are the part of your brain learning how to form arguments. So if all of a sudden your teachers are like, why do, why do I have 30 attorneys in my class, right? It's because the part of your brain that's like, well, what about this? And what about that? Have you thought about this? You know, if, if you're at a friend's house and your parents are like, hey, can you come home at 8? You get home at 9 and they're like, oh, I used to be home at 8. You're like, mm, you used to be home at 8 when I was at Jordan's house. Last week when I was at Nate's house, he let me stay out till 10. So Nate showed up at Jordan's house, so I cut the difference, came home at 9. Your parents are like, what's going on? Right? Like you're using the part of your brain to argue and you're using it all the time. And so sometimes we argue against our gut instinct that helps keep us safe. So that's a big part. The last part of the brain to be done is the part of the brain that says, is this a good idea? That develops in your early 20s. So there's these like immediate needs, the part of your brain that's like, is this a good So I'm going to tell you one embarrassing story of myself, hopefully the only embarrassing story of myself you hear today. When I was in ninth grade, I kept a written journal. And I would hide it. And I grew up with all brothers in my family. And I was convinced that one of my brothers was like going to come in and read my journal. They never did, but I was ready. So I like would hide it in different spots in my room with all of my ninth grade stuff. And um, so I got to the point where I totally lost my journal, couldn't find it. So I was leaving to go to college, and I cleared out the whole room to be like, okay, let's figure out what I'm taking for college. And I found my ninth grade journal. It's like, oh, ninth grade Allison. So I'm flipping through it, and one of the entries, my pen was really dark. Don't know if you've had one of those days. The language was definitely not internet appropriate. I was like, what happened? Like, what's going on? I'm reading this. I'm not going to use her real name. But apparently a girl named Heather, not her real name, had said a horrible thing to me in the cafeteria that day. And I was like, my life has forever changed. I'll not be able to eat in the cafeteria again. I should probably go to a different school. My mom is, happens to be from Australia, just backstory. So I was like, I'm going to move to Australia. But my relatives are like, I, this is I'm done forever. Da, da, da. And I'm reading it four years later, and I'm leaving to go to college. And I have two problems. First problem, I don't remember this day at all. It's like, your life is forever changed. I'm reading it. I'm like, don't remember. Second problem, I don't know who Heather is. <laughs> I'm reading it. I'm like, Heather is the worst person ever born. And I'm like, I'm like, who's Heather? I have no idea. And if I would have had the internet in that year's, which it was not yet invented. That's like my own, I walked uphill both ways in the snow story. If the internet would have been invented then, I could have gone online and been like, Heather's the worst. I'm creating the I hate Heather fan page. Like, come like, we'll put how much we hate Heather. And then we've created this like footprint of immediate anger of being in the moment. And the part of my brain that says, is this going to be a big deal in four years? Doesn't even know who Heather is in four years. So brain development is a big part of it. Any other one more thought from someone who hasn't had one yet before I move on? You have a lot of good ones. So I make sure if. Okay, and if, if you think of one, did you have one more? Go for it. Um, stuff like uh, older kids are usually like on TikTok. Yeah. And uh, it's like, have you lost cyber bullying? It can like get people really depressed, and sometimes it can like get them fished. Yeah. So there's the issue of cat, you brought up a few issues. There's the issue of cyber bullying, there's the issue of catfishing, there's the issue of just creating content. Have, have any of you ever heard the rule on the internet to not read the comments? Like, if you read the comments, you lose all hope in humanity, right? Like that. Just that idea of most people use the internet well. Most of you use the internet well. But the few people who aren't cause huge ripple effects that affects a lot of people's lives. And so there was, and some of you might have followed this, there was someone who worked at Facebook who leaked some research that wasn't supposed to go to the public, but it was leaked just based on Instagram. I'm not hating on Instagram other, other, on other versus other apps. This was just where this person worked when they leaked this document. And the research basically said that teens found that they felt unattractive after using Instagram, 40%. And include all genders. It was sometimes people think it's just girls, but all genders had some impact about how they feel about themselves from using this app. So we're like, okay, that's one issue. And then this is from an older study, just talking about the more time with screens, the less we feel good about ourselves. So this is not even getting to like crimes. This is just like balance. 
I was working with 11th and 12th graders and I asked them where they put their phone when they sleep. And in a class of 30, I had two of them who said they sleep with it on their heart. Because they want to make sure if any of their friends have a hard time or a problem, they can wake up in the middle of the night and help their friends. I was like, oh my God, that just sounds like you all need the most sleep of anyone in our society and you all get the least amount of sleep. Because you have to be here early. You have activities that are late. You have homework that's late. Like, you, it's hard to balance as is, let alone having breaks from phones. When I started teaching internet safety in 2001, don't raise your hand if you were born yet because it'll make me sad. Just, just be with me for a second. I started eating, eating, teaching internet safety in 2001. The number one question I would get from parents is, should we get a computer? They would raise their hand at the end of the presentation. Should we get one? We're going back and forth. Like, we're not sure. I haven't heard that question now in a decade. The number one question I get from parents now is, how do we create balance so they're not always on their phones? Two things I want to say about that. Number one, it's not just teenagers. I feel, I'm up here, and I don't have my phone with me, and I'm, every so often my hand goes to my pocket being like, am I missing? Like, it's just, it's a part of sort of who we are. It's not just teenagers. So that's the first piece. The second piece of that idea is just the importance of balance. How do we create balance so that our, our self-esteem isn't based on what we see? Let's just look at that last sentence. This particular study was girls, but this study, the more time the girls spend with their screens, the lower their self-esteem. Why do you think, and again, internet a bad, not a bad thing in a whole, it's how we use it. So how can we use it in a way that's more helpful? Why do you think it is that the more time was spent with screens, the lower the self-esteem. What are two or three ideas about that? Why more time with screens, lower self-esteem? Yeah, go for it. You're going by what the media said. Now, here's the deal. I am aware that 12 to 17 is a really big group of people. There are 16-year-olds that I would trust to do child care for my kid. There are 16-year-olds that I'm not going to give a hot glue gun to. Right? Like, and sometimes it's the same kid like just on a Monday versus a Friday, being like, today we're in a good spot, today we're not. So I'm speaking really broadly about a very vast group of people who are very different. So we're looking at patterns and trends, but I know not everybody is going to fit into every pattern and trend. So the idea first just about media influence. Some people are more influenced than others. My presentation is not about the Kardashians. I'm not hating on the Kardashians. It's not what I'm here about. But I did see an interview with Kim and they asked her, how long, does it get ready? how long does it take you to get ready for an event where you're going to be photographed or videotaped? And she said, it takes me three hours with three people. I have more wardrobe, hair, makeup, and myself. And sometimes there's more than three doing hair, makeup, wardrobe. And then after three hours, I'm ready to go out and represent that product. I don't know if you could tell, I did not take three hours to get ready today. I did not have any help. I did this all by myself. Um, but sometimes when we look at a photo with people who do this work professionally, they look a certain way professionally. They're asked to sell products a certain way professionally. That can be exhausting for us when we're trying to compare to that. So you see someone completely done up, completely set for the day, and you're home petting your dog, and you're like, what's wrong with me, right? And dogs are awesome, so that's not like a, not hating on dogs. Um, but it's that idea about like, you see these people who are, and we've kind of done a disservice, I think, in the internet safety chatting world. So we've talked so much about like putting your best foot forward. You know, hey, you want to make sure the stuff online isn't going to prevent you from getting into college. You want to make sure the stuff you put online isn't going to, you know, have people not want to hire you for their summer camp or whatever. And there's a piece of that. You definitely, we know that people look at social media to make decisions about hiring, about scholarships, about things like that. But... We also don't want to make people feel like they have to be 100% polished all the time and be their best absolute self all the time because then we're looking at everyone else's highlight reel and we're living the day-to-day -day of our life and we're like, ah, what's wrong here, right? And so there's that too. I think also some of the things that when I've been at schools that they've said is just comments can really get to you. You can hear someone say something when you see it in print. It can be more hurtful. I do a lot of musical theater. You can't tell today because my voice. Um, but I, I direct shows quite a bit. And I'll see like kids who are really interested in theater recording their like audition attempts and people being like, oh, you sound horrible. Don't even try out. It's like, calm down, people, right? Like, so there's that, too, that can impact self-esteem. Sleep is important. I just have to say it. 
It's a really good idea to sleep without your phone in your room, to charge it outside of your room, turn off Wi-Fi at night, whatever it is to help you get decent sleep because you all need the most of it and it's a huge balance piece um, that you all don't get a lot of it. And it's gonna surprise no one here, but the more sleep you get, the better off you are health-wise. And so if you compete in sports, if you are involved in things, you know, if you're trying to do well academically, getting good sleep at night is super helpful. And so that's about balance. I was waiting in line to get bagels, very exciting event. Um, and there are two girls in front of me, they're discussing their Instagram account. And the girl looked at it, she said, oh, I was getting, I thought I was so great on this day of school and I only got four likes on my Instagram. She goes, Jody's first day of school picture, she got 30 likes, I'm gonna delete mine because the four is embarrassing. And she was talking to her friend about it and I wanted to like tap them on the shoulder. Like, it's really okay, but they didn't, I thought they'd like leave the bagel store being like, who's that lady? So I left them alone. But we do know that every time you get a like, it gives you a hit of dopamine in your brain, which is something that's kind of your brain wants to keep seeking out. And so you keep trying to create stuff to get that dopamine. And then it can be exhausting to try to always try to create content. Having breaks where you have your phone down for doing, you know, whether it's you know, athletic activities, going on a run, talking to friends, like intentionally putting your phone down to sleep can be a huge reset for your brain and your brain chemistry. 54% of teens say, yeah, I think I spend too much time on my cell phone. Raise your hand if you think teenagers in general, not at the school, teenagers in general spend too much time on their cell phones. Raise hands if you think that that's the case. So about 56%. Okay, next question. Raise your hand if you think adults spend too much time on their cell phones. Pretty much about even. And it's interesting... There's not always one right answer, but it's interesting to look at trends. Over half of teens say if they don't have their cell phone with them, it makes them feel a certain way. A certain amount of parents say, yeah, I spend too much time on my phone. 51% of teens say I'm trying to have a conversation with my parent, and they're not paying attention because they're on their phone. I would ask you to raise your hand if that's ever happened, but I think it would be more than 51%. Oh, okay. Have you ever, had, you ever tried to have a conversation with your parent, and they're distracted by their phone? And I'm the parent who does that too. So yeah, so it's just about the first piece with internet safety is taking time away. Because if all we do is think about this and how that represents us, it's exhausting. And so to create balance, balance is the first idea. Someone brought up the brain science, thank you for that. Brain's not done till, the 20, till you're about your 20s. And the interesting thing is when teenagers are overwhelmed, they go to the emotional part of their brain. I'm like, why are you crying when I asked you to take out the garbage? It's like, because you always ask me to take out the garbage. It's like, we jump to the emotional part of our brain when we're overwhelmed. And so that idea about when we're on technology, the big piece is when we are emotionally overwhelmed, step away from your device. People make the most mistakes online when they're emotionally upset, and they go to their device. Number one thing is when you are upset, angry, mad at someone, Step away from your phone, step away from your device. Because whatever you send in that moment, you can't take back when you've calmed down. You can write it down, you can talk to a friend, but step away from your device when you're worked up. Because we see young people making horrible mistakes when they're worked up that they have to pay the penalty on for a long time. We had, I had a kid, two high schoolers who were dating and one had sent the other one pictures that were concerning that she probably shouldn't have sent the person. That's another conversation for later down the presentation. They broke up in the middle of the night and he took those pictures that she had sent him and sent them to all of her relatives. Grandparents, aunts, uncles, parents, he knew some of the numbers. Talk cringe, right? Total, and she, in the morning, the parents had called law enforcement and said, I have these pictures of my daughter I'm not supposed to have. This guy sent it to me. Knock on the door early in the morning from law enforcement to interview him. His argument was, I was just worked up, I was upset, whatever else. When people are really, really upset, that's when they make the most hurtful decisions for other people. Step away from your device when you're worked up. Wait till you've calmed down because you don't want to do anything that has long-term consequences in that immediate moment. Interestingly enough, we have lower rates for teenagers telling us when there's a problem online versus when they're having a problem in person. Our rates for teenagers saying someone's messing with me online 
are lower than when someone's saying they're messing with you in person. I can tell you the two main reasons that high schoolers tell me why the disclosing rates are so low. I wonder if any of you can guess what it is. So when I ask ninth through 12th graders, why do you think disclosure rates are low? What do you think their answers are? I'll tell you the two. We'll see if anyone can guess it. Why do you think disclosure rates are low when it comes to online crimes? You can use your criminal justice brain, that's right. I'll tell you the first, then maybe you'll guess the second. The first one is they have no idea what their parents will do. So if I tell my parents, Someone's messing with my online. I have no idea what they are going to do, so not knowing makes me not want to tell them. Which is why tomorrow I'm going to talk to parents and caregivers and other people about talk about this stuff before there's ever a problem so they know what you would do. Listen, I'm not going to, I'm, you know, here's what we're going to do. I almost gave away the second one. What is the second one? The second one why people say they don't want to tell their parents or caregivers if they're in over their head online. Go ahead. They don't know what to do. Yep. Was your hand in the, in the back row? Was it up? Or are you stretching? Stretching. Okay, go for it. Embarrassed? Embarrassed? That's three. Yep, that's in there. It's on the list. I don't think I've. Go for it. They're overthinking. That's definitely part of it. They might think that the person who's doing it will find out about it. They're. They're worried that the person who's acting out this way is going to find out about it. That's a part of it. It's not number two, but it's part of it. Um, they're worried about what their parents will do. They're worried that their parents will take away their phone. The number one thing that I hear is if I tell my parents are going to take away their, my phone. We had a case in Minnesota of a person who, what's, it's called, I'm going to talk about it later, but it's called sextortion. It's where you get someone to send a picture of themselves where they're not wearing clothes. And then once you have that picture of them, you extort them. You say, if you don't give me $500, I'm going to send this picture out. If you don't meet me and give me this stuff, I'm going to send this picture out. The number one group that's being sextorted in the cases that we see in the cases nationally are young male athletes. That's the number one group that's being extorted in this way. So we had a case in Minnesota of a person, I think he's going to be coming up, in a slide or two, if not. Um, but his name is Anton Martinenko. Don't want to make him famous. I'm just saying his name in case you're like, I want, to, I want to see more about this. But he was exploiting high school male athletes. He would find out what teams they'd play for. He'd reach out pretending to be a female. He would convince them to send a sexual picture of themselves. In some cases, he was pretending that he owned a modeling agency. So that's a part of how he'd get them to send these pictures. They were able to get, they were able to find 178 different boys who he had done this to. Because he saved all the pictures on his desktop by folders of what schools they went to. So he found 178 different boys. He's currently serving 38 years in prison, so that's the good news. But so few of these victims came forward. I was watching a documentary about it, and one of the boys was being interviewed, who is now a college student, and he said, hey, I still haven't told my mom and dad. So mom, dad, if you're watching this documentary now, sorry I haven't told you this is why I was having a really hard time when I was a junior in high school. And I was watching and I was like, oh gosh, like his parents are going to be flipping the channels late at night and they're going to see their son and have no idea that this happened to them. I hope that somebody helps before that happens. But it's that idea of some of those young men felt like they didn't want to tell because they are worried of what this guy would do. Some didn't want to lose access to their phones. And some it's just like, how do I start this conversation? It's embarrassing. I can't believe I fell for this. And here's the thing. It's never, ever, 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 ever the fault of the person who's being targeted when someone's trying to make you feel safe, unsafe online. So we can do a better job of talking about this. And one way is just to know the words, know that this happens, and know that this ever happens to you. It's not your fault. I know that there are people in this room, statistically, who have been on the other end of receiving online hate who've been on the other line end of seeing online anti-woman comments, anti-gay comments, and racist comments. Like, we know that that exists. And it's never OK. Everyone deserves to feel safe online. And a part of that is us not being a part of the problem. So part of it is knowing you don't deserve that, and you have every right to ask for help. And I do a funny thing. When I'm with little ones, when I'm with like first, second, third graders, we build our safety nets with our hand. I say, who are the five grown-ups? 
Or if someone breaks your safety rule, you can talk to. So if you're walking through your day and someone breaks your safety rule, you can tell one of these five grown-ups. I'll have kids be like, my dad, my aunt, my mom's best friend, my grandma, and they're this little boy, third grader. He's like, my dog. It's like, dogs are amazing. I love my dog. I have a dog named Dobby. He's 12 pounds of wonder. He's great. Um, one second. So I said, you can talk to your dog or your cat or whatever animal that you have to help get the words out, but then you need to find an adult. And he looked at me with his little blinking, adorable eyes. He said, but mom, not mom, I'm not his mom. He's talking about his mom. He said, but Allison, my dog doesn't interrupt me or tell me what to do. My dog just listens. My mom interrupts me and tells me what to do. And I was like, oh. So I feel like we as adults can do a better job. And tomorrow we're going to chat about the difference between listening to fix, when we listen to fix a problem, and when we listen just to listen. And sometimes we need to help our parents out by saying, listen, I have a problem. I don't want you to fix it. I just want you to hear me out so I can get it out. Because parents want to help, and sometimes our attempt to help makes it harder for you to talk. So we want to do a better job of being the family dog and just being present. So we started talking about the internet. We started by saying, don't put stuff online that you just want to see, that you wouldn't want to see in a billboard. Don't send pictures you wouldn't want to see in a billboard. That's just where we started. This was a long time ago. And then I'd, I was speaking to 14 year olds at a middle school. And I was doing this, I was kind of like very like trying to be authoritative and be like, so once you send a picture out and you can never get it back and it's always out there and don't send it. And I had a girl raise her hand. She said, I'm 14. I've already sent a sexual picture out of myself. Am I done forever? I don't want any 14-year-olds to feel like they're done forever. Any problem that's online can be solved in the real world. And there are times where people get tricked into having photos taken, tricked into thinking that they need to send a photo to be in a relationship, and then it's used against them. That other person should not be using those photos to harm you, and you can get help. So yes, we don't want to put pictures online that we want to see a billboard, but also if someone does trick us into these photos, we can work on it. My, one of the youth I work with, who I love dearly, he got fired from his job in high school because he was tweeting about how much he hated his boss. And there are people who he worked with who were like, hey, boss, see what he's tweeting about you. I don't know how exactly it happened. Maybe they had someone from corporate, you know, scrolling Twitter accounts, whatever, but he lost his job. And he said, Allison, I wasn't even tweeting at work about how much I hate my boss. I was tweeting at home. I was like, well, here's the deal. When you put something online, it creates this online footprint that can open up doors to you or close doors to you. We want to create an online footprint that opens up doors to you. And once we live through awkward consequences, the one thing about brains is they don't want to live through awkward consequences again. And so once we, sometimes we have to live through the awkward so that next time we say, I'm not going to text my boss. I'm not going to text about how much I hate my boss. But we sometimes do just have to trudge through the awkward to get to the other side. And sadly, that's a big part of 11 to 17. The other piece is just to be aware that sending sexual pictures when you're under 18 is considered, is considered against the law in most places. I mean, it is against the law, but some, it depends how people prosecute. But anyway, we don't want to send sexual pictures, in, I would say, just in general. Um, college students didn't know that could be against the law. They said if they knew that that would be against the law, they might have changed them from sending that. So just that's one piece of the puzzle to not send it because it can be problematic in that way. But that's not where we start, stop, because the number one reasons kids send sexual pictures is because they feel pressure or coercion. They feel like they're backed up into a corner, and that's the only choice that they have. So a few things to say about that. There's always other choices to make. If someone is making you feel that way, it's not OK. Sometimes caring in a relationship slowly, slowly, slowly switches to controlling. And we don't often see that slow switch, but other people see it. If I'm waiting in line to get ice cream, and there's a couple in front of me, and one of them says, hey, I'm going to go to the bathroom. Can you order for me? You know what I usually like for ice cream. And the other person says, great. That, to me, as a non, like, I have no idea about these two people, that just looks like an act of caring, right? 
If I'm standing in line and one person looks at the other person and is like, just so you know, I don't think you should get ice cream today. I think that that outfit is already too tight. And if you get ice cream, it's going to be really tight. And I don't want to be seen with you if you look that way. So I'm the only one getting ice cream today. As a third party who does not know this couple, that has switched from caring to controlling real quick. And I don't, they, that other person doesn't usually notice that shift. But if you've been friends with somebody who's been in a controlling relationship, you have seen it. You've seen that shift. Healthy friends, healthy relationships want to be one of many people who know who you are and know about you and care about you. Unhealthy people want to separate you from the people that you love. No one cares about you but me. You can't be friends with those people if we're dating. We're the only ones who are going to be in this chat, whatever it is. That, that behavior is isolating. We see that online with online patterns. Pay attention. Anyone who tries to isolate you from the people who care about you. It's a big warning sign. I'm going to say one more thing about that before I move on. I was with an eighth grade confirmation class. We were talking about the pressure to send sexual pictures. One of the girls said, you know, there's a guy I really like, keeps asking me to send pictures. And this can be all genders, but this happened to be this dynamic. And she said, there's this guy I really like who keeps asking me to send these pictures. Like, I've run out of ways to say no. I said, my dad pays my phone bill. If he sees it, I'll lose my phone. The guy said, well, as soon as you send it, just delete it off your phone. They said, I don't want other people to see it. My friend, he sent those pictures. The person that showed everyone on the swim team. We're, better, we're in a better relationship than that. I won't show anybody. She said, I've run out of ways to say no. Do you have any ideas for me on how to say no? So I threw it to the kids in the room, the other kids in the confirmation class. I said, what do you all have? And the first person, he raised his hand. He just came up to the microphone and he said, dump him. I went back and sat down. There was a big applause. It was a big moment. It was good. Um, but then other people raised their hand and said, you know what? I've always been taught that if you're spending a lot of time with somebody, you should be bragging about them and not apologizing for them. It sounds like you're apologizing for this person instead of bragging about them. I would be careful of any relationship where you're apologizing instead of bragging. I was like, nice. And other people were like, if they don't respect your no on the phone, what are they going to respect when you set a boundary in person? We're having great dialogue. And I was like, I'm doing a great job. I'm really good at my job. I'm doing wonderfully. I was feeling really good about myself. Then a young man raised his hand, and he looked at the girl, and he said, do you feel comfortable giving me his number? Because in my house, I've always been taught that when it's about bodies and someone says no, you stop asking. You don't need a because. He said, and so instead of us telling her how to handle it, why don't I just call him and tell him to stop asking? I was like, I'll go home. You can finish teaching the class. Like, that's good, you know. We spend so much time telling people how to say no and how to set boundaries and how to stick with those boundaries. We also have to tell the people to stop asking. It's not just on the shoulders of the person who's trying to figure out the 10th way to say no. When someone says no and it's about their body, they don't need a because. That's just where a conversation ends. And if someone's trying to force you to do something with your body that you don't want to do, red flags are waving in the breeze. But here's the deal. Our gut instinct, the thing that helps keep us safe, that starts when we're real young. The part of our brain that's learning how to argue is doing the most work when you're a teenager. And we biologically argue against our gut. So like, if my four-year-old this morning grabbed an apple from the hotel we're staying at and bit into it and was like, oh, this is gross. Mom, can you throw this away? That's probably how that would go. With a 14-year-old, the way that might go is this. Oh, this is gross. Everyone come look at it. Right? Because it's that gut instinct that we argue against. If a gazelle, better example, if a gazelle is lapping water by its stream and it sees a rustle in the trees and something coming towards it, what's a gazelle going to do? Run. Absolutely. If it wants to stay alive, run. A four-year-old in the same situation. Rustle in the trees, something coming towards it. Who's taking care of me? What's going on? Grandma, whatever, right? What we often see with 14-year-olds, and I don't mean this as a, as a put-down, the part of your brain so learning how to argue starts arguing against your guts. We often see is, you know what? That tree is shaking and something's going to try. I'm going to go walk up to the tree. I'm going to go stick my head inside the tree. I'm going to figure out what's in the tree. And then when I figure it out, then I'll figure out what to do about it. It's like you watch a horror movie and there's the teenager who's like, is that a noise in the garage? I'm going to go see what it is. And you're like, don't. Don't go see what it is, right? But that gut instinct of like a four-year-old seeing an image on the computer that they're like, I don't think I'm supposed to see this. Dad, come here. 
14 year old's like, I don't think I'm supposed to see this. Friends, come here, right? It's just different as we're arguing against our gut. And here's the thing. If your gut and your brain are arguing, you have two strategies. Find someone whose brain is done and ask them for help. Or step away until your brain and gut can catch up. So one of the eighth graders I work with, he said, Allison, I have a great brain gut story for you. I was like, oh, this is going to be good. He said, I was on an online game. And he said, it's gaming. And someone started approaching me in the chat saying they've developed a brand new beta video game that they want to send me the thumb drive of to test. And he said, and I was like, he said, my brain was arguing, being like, free game. My gut was like, this guy wants my address to send me a free video game. That seems too good to be true. Because guts, two, two, two messages with the gut, either this feels dangerous or this seems too good to be true. And we see people like sending out the picture of like, if you send this out, you win a trip to Disney World. It's like, listen to your gut, probably too good to be true. So anyway, he said, it felt too good to be true to get a free video game. Plus both, he was also asking me to do something I'm not supposed to do, give my address away. He said, so my brain and my gut were arguing, so I went and made a sandwich. Like crime prevention, right? Like he went and made a sandwich. So he's like, so while I'm making a sandwich, I'm thinking about it. He said, and I came back after eating the sandwich, and I said, I would love a free game. Please tell me where you work and the address of where you work, and I will reach out to corporate and figure out how I can get a free game legitimately. And the guy would not do that. He would not say where he worked, would not say any of the information. And so this young man said, so then I made a report, because I figured if I almost got tricked, he might trick somebody else. He's like, because of that, the brain and gut, you know, I'm like, if crime prevention is making sandwiches, I'm in this for the long run. This is good. So, yes, be aware your brain. And the two questions are not so much focused on do I know them or not for online safety, because we almost always know the person making us feel uncomfortable. It's usually someone we know. Sometimes it's not, but often it is. Two questions. What are they asking me to do? How do they make me feel? Are they asking me to do something I know I'm not supposed to do? It doesn't matter if you've been dating them or if they're your friend or whatever. If they're asking you to do something you know you're not supposed to do and they're making you feel a certain way, zone in on that. It's not do I know them or not. How do they make me feel? What are they asking me to do are your two biggest questions. So every social networking profile has different pros and cons. The ones that we have the most trouble with are ones that allow for back and forth messaging. Because offenders, most adults don't hurt kids. Most adults respect kids online. Offenders who are trying to make kids feel unsafe on the internet want to isolate. And in order to isolate, they need to talk to you one on one. So be wary of anyone. An adult wanting to talk to you at 3 p.m. on a chat app, big warning sign, right? You don't always know they're an adult, and that's part of the hard stuff, so we'll talk about that. We just want to avoid like basic personal information about yourself. Be, be aware that it's the emotional information about yourself that puts you more at risk. It's not so much putting up a picture of yourself in your soccer uniform, putting up a picture of yourself with your football jersey. That doesn't tend to put kids at risk. I've had one case ever where it was personal information that was the problem, where the girl was saying, I work at Subway. I make sandwiches every day from 3 to 5, and I'm bored. Come visit me. And someone came to visit her with bad intentions. That's the only one where I've had like personal information, although you do want to be careful about personal information. I was talking to third graders. I was like, avoid personal information. A boy's like, I put my garage code online. My dad got really mad at me. I was like, correct. Like, that is something we don't want to do. Don't put your garage code on the internet, right? Like, basics. But it's more about the emotional information that puts people at risk. No one loves me. No one cares about me. I have no one to talk to. That's what more offenders are looking for. So we do a lot of what-if questions before there's a problem just to figure out, like, what do we do if? The number one warning sign on the internet and on phones is people who want to talk to you about sex. Because here's the thing, people who want, to, who want to cause harm to kids on the internet, the number one thing that they do is they want to talk to kids about sex. They did a survey of folks in prison serving time for harming kids online. They said, what are you trolling for when you're looking for a victim? Number one thing, kids who have questions about sex want to talk about sex. So we want to get good information about our bodies that are healthy, that are not from a person on the internet. And I remember, I mean, there's curiosity. I remember being in third grade, there was a big red dictionary by the side of the pencil sharpener. 
And every so often a whisper would go through our third grade class of being like, right now, if you go sharpen your pencil, the dictionary is open to the word penis. <laughs> what? And you would go and like sharpen your pencil. And it was, it was like this whisper. We all, our teachers were probably like, why is everyone sharpening their pencil right now? Like, why do all the third graders suddenly have pencil sharpening emergencies? But there was this curiosity. It's like, what is this? What is this about? We want to get good information about bodies, not from someone on the internet. Because here's the deal. Most people use the internet well. Someone wanting to talk to you about sex on the internet, not one of the healthy grown-ups, right? And that caring can turn into controlling real fast. Interestingly enough, when they tracked, they looked at a series of chats of offenders talking to kids. Over 90% of the, 98% of the time, they brought up sex within the first day of chatting. And over 50% of the time, it was in the first half hour of the conversation. So that caring moves to controlling real quick. Because they have 100,000 and billion people, not, not math, um, that they're trying to find someone to cause harm to. And the quicker they can get that person talking about sex, the quicker that that adult can then define what they think is OK. You've never tried this. You've always wanted to know about this. Now you can't tell your parent, because we've been talking about this. They're going to be embarrassed. I just sent you a picture. And if you don't send me one back, we're not friends. This isn't OK. It's like, what? Big warning sign. The healthy adults in your life want you to have healthy information so you can make good decisions about bodies. Unhealthy people are trying to set bad standards and give you bad information. So that's the number one thing to be wary about, anyone who doesn't want to talk to you about sex. And I think back, I mean, when I was in middle school, I would go and spend the night at a friend's house in my neighborhood. And every night, this is 1987, so put that in perspective, she would call the DJ on the radio. Again, put it in perspective, and make a, a song request. Because we used to listen for the song and press record on our boom box, yep, um, to get that song, so we'd like have it on our tape. So she would call and make a request, that was like six level, levels of dating myself, but I'm cool with it. It was a good time. And she would talk to that DJ. And she was like, how was your day? What's going on? Can I have this request? Da, 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 da. And he would say, good night. She'd say, good night. And that was it. And I remember being thinking that was so cool. I was like in fourth or fifth grade. It's like, she calls the DJ at night. That's amazing. That's so cool. I could never do that. When we're adults, she faced friend of me on Facebook. We were chatting. And I was like, oh, my most vivid memory of spending nights at your house was when you'd call the DJ and make requests. She was like, Allison, I was being horribly abused at home. She's like, my stepfather was horribly abusive. My mom was horribly abusive. That's the only person at night who would say goodnight to me. She said, I would call that radio station every night for years so that I would have one person who loved me who said goodnight to me. She's like, I never met the DJ. This isn't like a worst case scenario. Like, and then the DJ came to her house, da, da, da. No, DJ was fine. He would just say goodnight, and that was her one person in her life who loved her in her world, in her fourth grade world, would say goodnight to her. Kids who most are looking for that attention and affection are often going to look for it online. I think about if she and I would have had the internet, and she's looking online just to find any adult to care about her to say goodnight, how in over our heads we could have gotten. And it was just that need to be, have someone pay attention. Um, we want to be, if someone sends a, a sexual image to you over your, your cell, please tell someone at your school, if they go to your school, please tell a parent, because usually it's someone else forwarding that message, and to get to the, to the source and to get that, that message off, we need to get adults involved. I know that it's embarrassing, but you're being a good friend by letting an adult know that's going on so we can get to the source and get that person back to where they're not having that happen. If you're dealing with someone who you're dating or you spend a lot of time with and they don't respect the word no, that's time to take a break from that person because your no is your power and you're allowed to use it as much as you want. Any questions about any of that before I move on? I know it's a lot and we're talking about a lot in a short time, but I just want to see if there's any questions. And these are some of the what ifs I'm going to go through with, with adults tomorrow too. Okay. So my question for you is who forms your net? Every kid, every teenager, every adult should have five people that they can reach out to who, whose brains are done, sorry, whose brains are done, who they can ask when they get in over their head. We say five because sometimes it's the person on the net who's breaking your rules. 
We say five because sometimes the first person you tell doesn't help. I had a whole really sad case um, of a girl who was being abused by a father, her, her dad, um, and then she told her dance teacher, and her dance teacher told her husband, and the husband then was trying to get her to send sexual pictures to him as well. So she was dealing with dad and this other person, and thankfully she told her youth pastor who had had training. I don't remember if it was a youth pastor or a priest, but it was, she told someone in her faith community, and that person immediately got her help. They were able to both hold accountable both the other people um, who were not causing help. So if you are creating your net and the first person does not help you, that's not on you. That's not your fault. We have five so you can keep telling until someone can help you. Good. Here's the thing. Most adults in your life understand online safety. Most adults in your life want you to be safe online. If you meet one of the rare adults who doesn't, find someone who does. To use a sporting analogy, if you're playing soccer and there's an adult playing soccer with you who does not know the rules, it is not your job to go up to them and explain the rules to them. I don't know if you've ever tried to explain rules to an adult. It doesn't usually go well, right? It doesn't usually go well. You do not have to go up to them and explain the rules. Get off the field and find an adult who does know the rules, because most do, and say, hey, this adult who's playing with the kids does not know the rules and someone's going to get hurt. Same thing online. If you're interacting with someone who doesn't know the rules, you do not have to engage with that person. That usually makes it worse. Get out of that situation, find someone who does know the rules, and ask for help. It is a good friend thing to do to get, more, to get an adult involved. It is a good friend thing to do. Most adults who love you love you no matter what. People who are trying to love you, if you do this thing, they're the problem. Pay attention if someone seems too good to be true. Pay attention to people trying to separate you from your people. Pay attention to people who say, I will love you if you do this thing. Your parents might say, I will love you if you take out the garbage. They're just meeting it as like, you know, please do that for me. But it's not really conditional. But if you meet someone who says, I will love you if you send me this picture, I will love you if you do this thing, it's a huge problem. Be aware of that. So our two questions, what am I being asked to do? What does my gut tell me? We want to guard our emotional information even more than our personal information. Have a written journal, right, like that you can look back at later and laugh versus sending it or talk to a friend in person. This is just that idea of offenders who are engaging online. Number one thing that they're doing is I want you to talk about sex. When I was in the night, I grew up with a little kid. We had the phenomenal book, Where Do I Come From? I don't know if any of you grew up with that one. I was like, Dad, let's read Where Do I Come From? That was fine, unless my cousins were spending the night. It's like, Dad, let's read Where Do I Come From? He's like, no. I do not know what your cousins know about their body. Let us pick a different book. I'm like, it's so good. Like, to me, I had no idea that it was different from any other book. It was just a book. And so having resources, having books, having information about bodies, fine, good. Not Googling breasts and butts, because you don't know what's going to happen, and you want to get information from written sources. If someone's asked you for sexual pictures of themselves, of yourself, do not send. It is a trap. Um, they also want to build that attention and affection. And then we see in some cases they just send us sexual pictures of themselves. It's not always themselves. And then they say, to be a good friend, you have to send one back. You do not ever have to send a sexual picture back to someone who sends one to you. Not allowed. This is that um, research I was talking about where they asked people serving time in prison. The number one thing that they're looking for is people who want to talk about sex. So we don't want to talk about sex on the internet. That's like when you go home today and you're like, what did Allison say? She told us not to talk about sex on the internet and to walk away from our laptops when we're upset. Then our day was good. I asked, my friend has a first grade daughter and I was doing first grade safety. Not this. I was not talking about this with first graders. No, I, I like to keep my job. Um, and she came home and my, her mom said, what did Miss Allison teach you in class today? She said, I learned I'm worth more than money. Allison said, if someone tries to give you money to get you break your rules, then you're worth more than money. So I learned I'm worth more than $20. I was like, OK. If that's what a first grader is going to retain, like, you, everyone in this room is worth more than $20, just so you know. You're all worth way more than money. So there are laws about sexting that, that discourage people from doing it, discourage. But it's less about the legal thing, and it's more about we want to see people for their whole selves. When you reduce someone to just their body parts, it's easy to hurt body parts. 
When you remember that every person in this room has dreams, has goals, has things that they're interested in, and we remember their whole self, body, spirit, brain, it's harder to hurt a person when we see them as a whole person. When we reduce someone to just their body parts, it's easy to hurt. So we want to keep their whole self all together. I don't know if any of you did when you were little, those like little signs of like the first day of school, what you want to be when you grow up. I did it for my four-year-old this year. She started pre-K, so I was like, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? And she said, a superhero. It's like, great, so she has this little sign being like, I want to be a superhero when I grow up. I don't, I want people to remember she's a whole person. You're, the people who love you want you to be remembered as a whole person. So we don't want to send sexual pictures out and reduce ourselves to just bodies, because that's easier to hurt than a whole person. We want to, if someone is using technology to hurt you, reach out, have your escape plans. Um, you can always use your parents as the bad guy. Hey, sorry, I can't watch this video. My parents will never let me come over here again for the rest of my life. I'm really sorry, I got to, you know. Um, realize that every behavior we do has a positive effect or a negative effect. We want to be the ones not causing harm. We also not want to text and drive, basic, it's online safety. And we want to be really careful about consent. When it comes to sextortion, I talked about that before. For nearly half the participants, the perpetrator followed through on their threats, which is one of the reasons why people are really, really don't want to tell. But we know that they keep telling until they're caught. Sorry, they keep doing this. Sextortion behavior doesn't just end until someone does tell. And so if you're that person telling, you could be saving 178 different people. We've seen a 150% increase in calls related to sextortion. So just be aware there are people trying to harm, cause harm this way. If it happens to you, it's not your fault. You can ask for help. Your local advocacy group, um, your local advocates, parents, teachers, law enforcement, people want to be helpful. And be aware that we want to build up our online knowledge so we can make better choices. There's a difference between thinking and knowing. You can come in this room and be like, I think I know a lot about internet safety. And then I do a what if, and then you really have to see if you do. And it's easier to just think, yep, I got this. But like, what if one of your friends was being extorted by someone who they dated? How would you handle that? And those kinds of what ifs are what builds us towards figuring out the solutions. We do have teenagers accessing adult sites. It's going to surprise no one that they lie about their age to get in. Sometimes young people stumble on adult sites. Um, and I use adult sites in the sense of like pornographic. Here's the thing. Once you see something, you can't unsee it. I was working with high school boys at an event. One of the boys said, Allison, I've never been on a date yet. Haven't held somebody's hand. I haven't kissed somebody. So I'm looking at a lot of adult sites. So when I find someone who likes me back, I know what to do. Here's the thing. Not instructive, not healthy, not helpful. Because the uh, pornographic sites takes the heart and the soul and the dreams out of people and puts them, just reduces them to body parts. So have an escape plan. If you're at a friend's house and someone wants to watch a video that's problematic, have another friend who has zero interest and be like, we're going to go outside and play basketball. We're not interested. Text an emoji to your parents. That means, like, come pick me up. I'm in over my head. But we don't, when we engage in this type of material, it impacts our in-person relationships. And it impacts the respect that we have for the people around us. And we want to be in in-person relationships that are based on respect. So step away from when you're upset. And I have, in our, we're going to tell a story, I think, in the next slide, oh, in a slide or two. We're good. We're, we're good. OK, sorry. I have one more big story, but it's coming up. So step away when upset. What do your words and image say? Are you being treated with respect online? Do you feel unsafe? And to figure out if you're in over your head, the number one question to ask is, do I, am I being hurt? Lots of problems you all can handle on your own with your friends. But if hurting is happening, someone's hurting you, you're hurting somebody else, someone else is being hurt, that's when we get adults involved. You are not a professional. I don't know if you know about this, but young people with really good listening skills, really good problem solving skills, tend to get dumped on by a lot of people's problems. If you have the two or three people in your class who are really good listeners, they're probably carrying 15 different people's problems right now. That is a heavy backpack. It's amazing to be a good listener. It's amazing to be an empathetic friend. If you are carrying a lot of problems, know that it's not a bad thing to have an adult help you unpack some of that. 
Because I, I worked with a young man who was an amazing listener, just so engaging, great student leader, and everyone went to him with his problems. And he was emotionally exhausted. We need to spread that out because we know that helping, helping people can get tired very easily. I get frustrated in my line of work when I hear the phrase, hurt people hurt people, because that's not what I see. Some of our best allies and advocates are helpers. It's helping people, healed people heal people. People who've been cyberbullied are gonna be the first ones to say, don't do that. People who have been extorted are gonna say, don't do that. Healed people heal people, and you all can do an amazing job of that. Be aware most teenagers have a hard time having parents look at their phone. This is a huge shock. Um, but I do think it's important for parents to keep tabs on what apps you use and why, what sites you go to and why, and every so often, Check with the search bar on the top of a text, typing in problematic words and see if those words are popping up um, to help before that gets into something where you're in way over their head, especially if they're paying the cell phone bill. I think they should just have a finger on the pulse of it. Most parents do go through teens' phones. I, this last stat makes me laugh. Most parents say, yeah, I have phone rules for my teens. <laughs> like 33% of teens asking the same families are like, yeah, they do. It's like, where's that big gap and stats there. So I think sometimes parents feel like that they've given that information and that we want a bit more. So we start with consent and empathy. Consent is making sure that people feel safe around us. And my child is, when my child was in daycare, if someone fell off the slide, they would teach kids to say, do you want to hug right now or do you want to be left alone? That's consent. I want people to feel safe around me. I'm going to check in. If anything is romantic, Always check in. You don't want to hold someone's hand if they don't want their hand held. Yikes, right? Like, ah, thank you, but no thank you. I have a head cold. Please don't touch my hand, right? Consent is checking in and making sure the other person feels safe around you. Is it okay to hold hands right now? Are you comfortable? Is this, right? It's just that check in. Um, empathy is teaching people to look at someone else's perspective. Consent isn't just about waiting for a no. I'm like, I don't want you to hold my hand, right? It's about confirming the yes, making sure they're enthusiastic. Anything on a romantic spectrum of behavior, you want to make sure that you have consent, that you're not coercing that person into doing something, that that person is enthusiastic about anything that's romantic, and knowing that no is a complete sentence. Our big picture in prevention is spending less time on the tip of the iceberg. Have any of you, in, how many of you have already taken driver's ed? A few of you, okay. Were any of you taught like I was, I don't know if you were, how to carry your keys in your hands so you can stab someone in the eye? Was that taught in your driver's ed class? Raise your hand, one, two. Adults in the room, how many of you were taught that in driver's ed? Yeah, my driver's ed class, first day. There you go. Everyone grab your keys if you have one, if not pretend. Thread them to your fingers and be prepared to stab someone in the eye if they ever try. What? I've never once had to use that, ever. Do I still do that? Absolutely, because I was taught in driver's ed, right? Um, we spend so much time putting our energy in the tip of the iceberg that we never have to know about because we don't usually know there's a problem until there's a problem. We need to spread that out to tell the bystander if you see something, support the person being targeted. And we also want to find the people causing harm and say, please don't. It's not just about saying no. It's also about saying don't sexually harm people. Don't ask people for sexual images. Don't, make, don't be the problem, right? So it's all and. This is just a girl who is saying that she, in seventh grade, one of my guy friends that I'd like since elementary school had been asking me to send him topless pictures. I refused. He said, oh, that's a shame. I was just trying to like you. So then stupidly, I sent them. Here's the thing. If someone's pressuring you to do something online, you don't need the word because half your body. It's easy for me to say, like standing up here and reading the slides, it's harder when you're in the moment. But if you have a plan beforehand, it's much easier to hold the no. And if you have a plan beforehand, you're much less likely to be the one asking for the pictures. So going from bystander to upstander means the more people watching something bad happens, the less likely someone helps. So if someone comes through the door right now, unlikely, steals my water bottle, what, and leaves, there's usually just gonna be a big like pause where we all look at each other. Did that just happen? Is that a part of our thing? Was, what was that with the water bottle? Like, the more people watch it, less likely someone helps. If someone steals a water bottle and you're the only one in here, you're like, excuse me, that's Allison's water bottle. It's covered in germs. Bring it back, right? 
We, and the, one of the tricky things with the internet is there's a lot of people, so you don't always know when to help. Err on the side of supporting the person who's being harmed. You don't have to go after the person causing the harm. That fans the fly, it flames, that makes it worse. Support the person being targeted. Send them a text. Listen, I know that this is being said. No one else believes that. If you want to hang out with my friends tomorrow, lunch list blows over, come on over, right? Like, support the person being targeted. Because cyberbullying, which is real and is common, you don't always know who it is. And so having people reaching out and supporting you can be huge. It can go on for almost anywhere. It goes on for a long time. It's hard. And if you've lived it, you know it's hard. But having real people in, in face, not, not that people on the internet aren't real, but having people face to face to talk to can make a huge difference. Reach out if you get in over your head. Lynn manuel Miranda says it better than I could because he's amazing. Um, but he talks about the fact that we only have this short time on, on the earth. And we, what are we going to do with that time? When people look at your yearbook, they're not going to maybe remember your name, but they're going to remember how you made them feel. 20 years from now, I can look at my yearbook and I can make these are the people who I remember how they made me feel. So we want to be the ones causing the help and not the harm. And when we do speak up, it creates that positive ripple. I talked about Jacob's case and how when one person harmed Jacob, it created this huge negative ripple. And how we as his friends try to create a positive ripple in his honor every day. So I'm going to go back one and then I'm going to talk about that. So as I wrap up, Going just a few minutes, you're going to have a break in a minute, but I started a few minutes late, so we're good. Um, I have a four-year-old, as I mentioned. She was turning three when COVID was like at its peak, like peak. Um, no one was vaccinated yet. That wasn't happening yet. They weren't available. And she wanted a big party, and I'm like, I'm sorry. We're not going to have a big party this year when you turn three. She said, okay, well, then can I get a donkey for my birthday? I live in a metro area. Like, and I don't want a donkey, two big things. I was like, no, we can't. She goes, I want to go with Mary and Joseph to Bethlehem, so I need a donkey for my birthday. I was like, we're not going to get a donkey. I'm already crushing her dreams once, okay? Twice, no party, no donkey. Third question, well, then can I please have a hot air balloon ride for my birthday? I just think that would be so cool to be up on a hot air balloon. No, you are three. That is a basket of fire in the air. Like, Nothing sounds more dangerous to me than having a three-year-old in a basket of fire. Like, she doesn't like the garage door opening because it's too loud. Like, a loud fireball, like, no. So, no, 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 right? So she said, well, can I at least have a really cool cake? I was like, yes, I'll get you any cake you want. She said, her favorite movie is Lion King. She said, I would like a cake of Mufasa, please, from The Lion King. But I want it to be where he's dead because everyone will be too sad to eat the cake. I can have it all to myself. Now. Raise your hand. Oh. Poor Mufasa. Raise your hand if you've seen this before today. 54 million people have viewed my brother's tweet with this picture on it. So my younger brother is a comedian. He lives in Los Angeles. Um, he, my old, so <clears throat> at her party, for clarity, my older brother was at her party. Her godfather was at her party and her godfather's wife, and me. Four adults. No one was harmed by this cake. We were all emotionally prepared by the cake. No children saw the cake. Four adults were at the party. She shared the cake with the four adults. It was not a big deal. So my younger brother, who is in Los Angeles, I took the picture and sent it to him because he couldn't be at the party, and she has been telling him all week about her dead Mufasa cake and how excited she was. And he asked my permission. He got my consent. Consent is important. We asked before we post. He said, can I post this out? She had been in his wedding a few months, a little bit before this. Um, and she was telling everyone at the wedding about her plans for her birth birthday. He's like, my friends who are at the wedding would love to see it. I think it's funny. Can I tweet this out? I said, yeah, sure, no problem. First time I realized it's a problem. Her party was like at 6 p.m. At 9 p.m., I get a text from her godmother, one of my best friends in the world, who's an animal trainer at Disney World. And, and she says, um, my goddaughter, your daughter, is on our Disney World employee fa Facebook page. I was like, what? Yeah, her, her cake is on our Disney World employee Facebook page. I was like, OK, this is going to be a thing. And I was, I, was, I was not near my phone. I was driving using the hands-free option, talking. Um, so I get to my parents' house where we're going to have some birthday stuff. And it had blown up. And people were reaching out to my brother, asking for the viable rights of it. We were getting calls from all these national news people, whatever else. So that was fine, weird. 
but fine. But the amount of people, so 54 million people have viewed the tweet. My brother gets, Twitter tells them, that's just the tweet, let alone when it's like on Upworthy or wherever else it goes. People on Upworthy were the meanest. They're like, this child's probably never been to a church in her life. This child's probably a serial killer. This child's probably a sociopath. This child should not be around animals. This child, and I was just like, calm down, she's three. Like, calm down. Um, I probably got 60 messages, DMs from people I don't know, telling me what a horrible job I'm doing as a parent. What a horrible child I have. So 54 million people see it, I get 60 DMs. My brother's like, put that in perspective. 54 million people see it, you get 60 DMs. But every DM is not nice. All the DMs are horrible and mean and telling me, I'm just like, block and bless, block and bless, block and bless, bless you, move on, block and bless. But it's hard when you're talking about your three-year-old and you're wanting to keep your three-year-old safe. And I'm like, I teach this stuff all the time. And yet I'm living it where all these people see one picture of my child and come to all these horrible conclusions about what she's like. And it was very sweet, though, seeing people like defend my honor. Like, she taught me confirmation class in ninth grade. She's great. Leave her alone. I'm like, thanks, Matt. How have you been the last 20 years? Like, it's very sweet. But, um, and then the people are like, the mom is just doing this for attention. I'm like, of what? My non-existent YouTube? My non-existent SoundCloud? Like, it was so weird. But anyway, every time I think it's done, it pops back up. It was a month ago, the lead story on Reddit again. I was like, stop. So be aware, anytime you send out a picture, even if you ask consent, it still goes places. We did, um, we, got, we did ask people if they wanted to donate to Zero Abuse Project so other kids could live out their quirky dreams to do that. So that was the only money that came in. Everyone's like, when you go viral, you make money. We made no money. A few donations came into Zero Abuse Project. But just be aware that you might see a picture of someone and come to really horrible conclusions about them when they're amazing, or their parents, or their families, and they're really cool people, and not to jump to conclusions. So be aware that with consent, make sure that the person can give you a yes. Know your resources. Be aware that you don't have to handle this stuff on your own. You're allowed to ask for help from adults in your life. So I'm going to thank you for your attention for that at the time. You're amazing. Pause. Don't do anything major. We're going to have the um, head of school come up and explain how break is going to work. OK, thank you all.